In a previous lecture, we saw that we can take a bunch of sine waves and assign to each sine wave um, a different frequency, a different amplitude, and a different phase. And we can sum these sine waves together and get a more interesting and more complicated signal. So that's very nice, that's very interesting. But in real data analysis, we have exactly the opposite problem. We already have the, or we start with the, uh, the more uh, complicated, intricate uh, signal, and we want to know which sine waves with which frequencies and which amplitudes and phases can we use to express this signal. So this is uh, going in the opposite direction from what we were doing before. And this gets even worse for, this problem gets even more significant for real EEG data, which has a lot of overlapping frequencies. And so the question is, how can we tell what frequencies are present in this signal uh, and, and, and with what strengths, with what timing? So fortunately, our good friend uh, Joseph Fourier comes to the rescue and saves the day. Fourier provided us with a, uh, a theorem, a algorithm, to be able to decompose this signal um, and uh, as a number of uh, sine waves with different frequencies, phases, and amplitudes. And in this lecture, what we're going to do is go through the mechanics of the Fourier transform and how the Fourier transform is implemented in MATLAB. Okay, so here is Fourier's fundamental theorem. Fourier said that um, any signal can be expressed as a combination of different sine waves, each sine wave having its own frequency, its own amplitude, and its own phase. One of the things that's very powerful about the Fourier transform is that it works perfectly for any signal, not only signals that are made up of uh, pure sine waves, or even that are oscillatory or periodic. Any signal can be expressed as a combination of different sine waves. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how the discrete time Fourier transform actually works. I mentioned in, uh, I think, the previous lecture that to understand the Fourier transform, you really only need to know two things. You need to know a sine wave, which we've covered, and you need to know the dot product, which we've also covered. And then, yeah, there's this uh, like 0.5th thing that you need to know about, which is uh, imaginary numbers and complex sine waves, but I think we can safely um, uh, skirt that issue for now because I don't think it's necessary to understand about uh, complex sine waves to understand how the Fourier transform is implemented. Understanding um, the complex sine waves is more important for understanding um, how to interpret the results of a Fourier transform, and this is something that we are going to discuss in in more detail in a future lecture. So here's how the Fourier transform works, the discrete time Fourier transform. You start with your EEG data, um, so uh, which might look something like this. And then you take a sine wave of some frequency. And the sine wave has to be as long as the data. So it starts and it stops with the data. And now at each step in the Fourier transform, Fourier asks, how similar are these two time series? So we want to know how much of this sine wave is present in our EEG data. And so we have some measure of similarity between these two time series. And I apologize for the, the GUI term, but I will define this uh, in a minute. And then we plot this measure of similarity or the relationship between the EEG data and this sine wave. Um, on a position on the y-axis corresponding to the frequency of that sine wave that we used. So this is one step of the Fourier transform. And uh, then the Fourier transform involves um, performing the same procedure for many steps. So we start with exactly the same data. Um, and then we do the same procedure, but it's slightly different, uh, or a sine wave of a different frequency and so on. So this is two steps of the Fourier transform. Here is another step of the Fourier transform. And again, it's always the same procedure, except that the frequency of the sine wave is changing. And at each step in the Fourier transform, we are asking how similar are these two time series? And whatever the answer to that question is, gets plotted on this um, in this uh, frequency domain plot um, with the, the result corresponding to the frequency of the sine wave. 
Okay, so Fourier keeps asking us, how similar are these two time series? So what does that mean, how similar are these two time series? If you saw the previous lecture on uh, dot products, then you can probably already guess where this is going. And the similarity is actually uh, expressed as the dot product between the EEG data and the sine wave. And so our good friend uh, Patrick McGowan uh, says, uh, what does that even mean? Um, but actually he already knows the answer, he's quite a clever guy. And he says, ah, the similarity between vectors is assessed through the dot product. So now this is interesting, we can think of or we can conceptualize the EEG data and the sine wave as just being two vectors. And if we think about them as two vectors, then it's very straightforward to think about um, the computing the dot product between these two vectors, the EEG data and the, and the sine wave. So yes, of course, he is correct. It is the dot product. Just as a um, very, very quick reminder, the dot product is a mapping between uh, two vectors. It allows us to get a single quantity, a scalar number, that reflects the relationship between a pair of vectors that are the same length, that have, that have the same number of elements. And the dot product is computed by um, pointwise multiplying the elements of the two vectors. And so we get one times one and two times four, and then we sum the resulting uh, products together. If this slide uh, seems confusing or you don't really know what I'm talking about, then you should go back and watch the previous uh, lecture on uh, on computing dot products. Okay, so now we know that at each step of the Fourier transform, uh, what we are actually doing is constructing a sine wave that has the same number of uh, time points as the EEG data. And this, of course, has to be the case because the dot product is only defined for two vectors that have the same number of points. And so now at each step of the Fourier transform, we are computing the dot product between a, a sine wave of, of a particular frequency and the EEG data. And what this means is that we take each element and we multiply them pointwise together. And then we sum up over all of these pointwise elements. And this result, the dot product, is what I was actually referring to earlier as similarity. And now uh, this is one step of the Fourier transform. Um, so now you might be wondering, well, uh, how many frequencies, how many sine waves do we use in the Fourier transform? Um, how many, uh, do we just get to use one or whichever frequencies we want to use? Or how does this work? Um, so we actually use the, or the number of frequencies corresponds to the number of time points. So if we have a signal with 10 uh, time points, then we have 10 frequencies. If we have a signal with 640 time points, then we use uh, 640 frequencies. This is something that I will talk um, more about in a future video on, um, or future lecture on, uh, on uh, how to convert um, these uh, uh, sine waves to frequencies in Hertz and how to uh, interpret those results. But for now, I'd like to uh, switch to MATLAB and, and show you the discrete time Fourier transform implemented in, uh, in MATLAB code. So in this first cell, we are just going to reconstruct a sine wave. Uh, this is exactly the same code that we used in a previous video on, uh, on making sine waves. And now what we are going to do in this cell, which starts on line 30, is compute the discrete time Fourier transform. So uh, first here on line 32, I'm just constructing a variable called the signal, which is just the sum of all those sine waves. This is not really necessary, but it just makes things a little bit easier. And here you will see this variable n come up over and over again. This is just the, the number of time points that we have. Um, when computing the sine waves in, uh, during the Fourier transform, we want to use a time vector that's defined as going from zero to something just less than one in the number of uh, time points uh, defined by the number of um, time points in the signal. So we do not define time in milliseconds or in seconds. This is kind of a, a unitless measure of time. For plotting the results of the Fourier transform, we also need to know something called the Nyquist frequency, which is simply half of 
the sampling rate. Uh, this um, and, uh, and some other details of how to extract and interpret the results of the Fourier transform, I'm not going to talk in, in any depth about in this lecture, but that will be the topic of another lecture. Okay, so what we are going to extract is a, or the result of the Fourier transform is going to be a vector of Fourier coefficients. Um, and so there is one Fourier coefficient per, uh, per frequency um, and the number of frequencies uh, yeah, defined as the number of time points. And so here I'm just initializing them to be the same size as the signal. This is where we define our vector of frequencies in Hertz. And again, I'm going to discuss this in more detail in a future video. Okay, here is the meat of the Fourier transform. This is actually doing the loop that does the Fourier transform. We need to compute uh, the dot product between um, a sine wave and uh, the data. And so the data we already have, that's this variable signal. And so now we need to um, define a sine wave. So here's the formula for creating a sine wave within uh, the context of the Fourier transform. Now, when you look at this piece of code, you might get a little bit confused at first because you you might be expecting something to look a little bit more like this, sine 2 pi of t. But if you remember from an earlier lecture, uh, I mentioned that you should be able to, you should have such a um, com comfortable familiarity with these three uh, formulae, the sine wave, the Gaussian, and the and Euler's formula, that you can recognize these three formula when they are embedded in a longer line of more complicated looking code. And so when you see a line of code that looks like this, you, you should be able to recognize that there are two equations in here. Um, one is something like a sine wave. So we have two pi f t, see two pi f t. So we don't have the sine thing. So you can already see that there's something slightly different uh, from uh, what you would think of as how you normally implement a sine wave in MATLAB. But still, your brain should be able to recognize 2 pi ft. So this is something about a sine wave. And the other thing you can see in here is Euler's formula, which is e to the i k. So here we have e to the i and then, you know, something else. We don't call it k here, but I could have called it k. So we just have e to the i something. So this complex sine wave, which we are going to discuss in more detail in a future lecture, this complex sine wave is just a combination of Euler's formula and a sine wave. And I hope that you can recognize these two expressions in this line of code. Okay, moving right along. So now we want to run uh, this line of code and compute the Fourier transform. Um, now, as you can see, line 53 is uh, incomplete. It is missing something. Um, so if you would like to have a little bit of a personal challenge, you can pause the lecture now and try to fill in line 53 on your own to get this to work. So in this line, we want to compute the dot product. And the way we compute the dot product is by taking the uh, pointwise multiplication of the sine wave and the uh, data, which I called uh, signal. And then we want to sum all of the points together. So this is how we um, compute the dot product. And this actually completes the Fourier transform. That's very, uh, very uh, convenient. So we can run this cell here. It plots the sine wave. Um, oh, this just plots one of the sine waves from the Fourier uh, transform. This is the original data. And here we can see the power spectrum derived from the discrete time Fourier transform. And this is the same result we saw in the previous lecture on um, on uh, sine waves. So, and you can match these values and their frequencies against uh, these which we define here. Uh, let me see. Okay, and so Patrick McCoon wants to know if Fourier has any further advice. Uh, particularly for small children. Of course, you should always brush your teeth. Um, and uh, you should never actually use the discrete time Fourier transform the way we just implemented it. Instead, you should use something called the fast Fourier transform. 
The fast Fourier transform is a way to get exactly the same results as the discrete time Fourier transform in much, much less time. Um, there are several different uh, algorithms for the fast Fourier transform, and I'm not going to go through how any of these algorithms work, but to suffice it to say that um, in the um, Fourier transform, if you would break up the Fourier transform into all of its constituent um, additions and multiplications, you would see that there's a lot of redundancy in the algorithm. And so different um, methods of the fast Fourier transform um, uh, basically take advantage of these of, of these redundancies in the discrete time Fourier transform and eliminate a lot of the redundancies and therefore um, can do the uh, algorithm much faster. And so now we can uh, go back and look at this in MATLAB. So now what we are going to do is uh, compute the Fourier transform again. Um, and now we are going to uh, use MATLAB's FFT function instead of going through this whole loop up here. So we can run this cell and you can see, so the, the blue line corresponds to the manual uh, discrete time Fourier transform and the red circles correspond to the results of the fast Fourier transform. You can see that they look very similar. In fact, they overlap perfectly. This is a, uh, a completely lossless uh, represent or, or way to compute the Fourier transform. I forgot to mention earlier that um, uh, because the Fourier transform involves uh, uh, computing a lot of sine waves over n uh, time points or n frequencies um, and sine waves, then we also have to scale back the results of the Fourier uh, transform uh, by by n. So we just divide the Fourier coefficients by n. This step is not technically necessary, but if you uh, do apply it, then the coefficients will be back in the scale of the original data. So if you like, you can try running this code again without dividing by n, and you'll see that the relationship amongst all these points is the same, so the result is still valid, but the y-axis is has a different scale, so it's no longer the same scale as the original data. Okay, so now I'd like to convince you that it's good to use the fast Fourier transform rather than the discrete time Fourier transform by comparing the computation times of the discrete time uh, Fourier transform and the fast Fourier transform. So here we are going to use MATLAB's timer, which you initiate with the function tick, and then you can uh, uh, close the timer or get the, 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 the elapsed time from the timer with the function talk. And what we're going to do here is compare the computation time for the manual um, Fourier transform, and this is exactly the same code as earlier. I just copied it again and uh, deleted the uh, comments. And now here we're going to do the same procedure um, with the fast Fourier transform. So you can see that the um, the manual Fourier transform was quite a bit longer in terms of computation time than the fast Fourier transform. In fact, fast Fourier, fast Fourier transform is so small you can you can hardly see the bar here. So this is uh, time in seconds, and maybe you're looking at this and saying, well, you know, this is only like uh, 155 milliseconds or whatever this is. So this is not really a practically significant difference. This is not a meaningful difference. I don't mind waiting 150 milliseconds for the Fourier transform to work. And fair enough. Uh, in this case, it doesn't make too much of a uh, big difference. But this is only with a signal that is 2,000 points long. And the speed of the Fourier transform, or the benefit of the Fourier transform, becomes even stronger when you use even more time points. And so now we can try running this again using uh, a longer signal. So we can make a longer signal either by starting time, the time vector earlier and going later, or uh, we can just change the sampling rate. So I increase the sampling rate by a factor of 10. We have uh, exactly the same signal uh, with just more uh, time points. And you can already see actually that it's the Fourier transform is taking longer to compute. So now, uh, now we have to wait for this uh, uh, very sluggish Fourier transform to compute again. 
And now you can see the computation time difference is, is quite more significant. So now the manual dis uh, discrete time Fourier transform took nearly seven seconds compared to, let's see, so it's almost seven seconds for the manual discrete time Fourier transform versus 1.5 milliseconds for the fast Fourier transform. And, and this is now only for a signal that is 20,000 points long. And for real data analysis, you will have um, you will have uh, time series that are millions or hundreds of millions of time points long. So the difference between um, implementing the Fourier transform manually like this versus using the fast Fourier transform function really becomes a difference of uh, a matter of, of days versus a matter of seconds. Okay. So. Fourier and I are in complete agreement about uh, this, which is that uh, I think it's good for um, for teaching purposes to and for educational purposes to go through the Fourier transform, the manual implementation, and see how it really works. Um, but in practice, you should never ever use the discrete time Fourier transform. You should always use the fast Fourier transform. Okay. So uh, now um, our friend Patrick McGowan wants to know how much information is lost in the Fourier transform going from the time domain to the frequency domain. And um, Fourier, who wants to know everything about uh, Patrick McGowan's uh, past, he, uh, he says that, uh, that we lose nothing. We don't lose any information. That means that the Fourier transform is a absolutely perfect, lossless, representation of the time domain signal. So why is this the case? And it, it's a little weird to think about in the beginning because uh, particularly for data, for, for signals that don't have any, that are not composed of pure sine waves, to try and think about how you can have a perfect representation of those signals using only pure sine waves. One of the ways that that uh, I like to think about why the Fourier transform is a perfect representation of the, uh, the time signal is I like to think about this in the context of a regression analysis. And so we can think of our time domain signal, the EG data, as our dependent variable. And we can think of the Fourier transform as like a regression or analogous to a regression. And all these different sine waves are our independent variables. And so here we have um, n data points in our dependent variable, but now we have um, n sine waves, um, and so that means n independent variables. And so when you have a regression model like this, where you have the same number of independent as dependent variables, you um, run out of degrees of freedom, which means you necessarily explain 100% of the variance of the signal. There's nothing left in the signal that you cannot explain. So um, a skeptical statistician might look at a model like this and say, well, this is not a very uh, sparse model. This is not a very parsimonious model. Uh, in fact, we, we, the statistician might say that we are overfitting the data. But in fact, uh, we are. This is the entire point of the Fourier transform. We want to fit the data perfectly. We are, we are not trying to come up with a parsimonious model. This is important because this means we can go from the time domain um, to via the Fourier transform to the frequency domain, and we do not lose any information. There's no information that's lost in this transformation. All of the information in the time domain signal is present in the frequency domain signal. It's really just a different way of looking at the same signal. Um, and so, uh, so, but this might be very uh, uh, of limited use. You know, if we can only go from the time domain to the frequency domain, then you might think, uh, well, you know, how, how useful is this exactly? What we really want to be able to do is go from the frequency domain back to the time domain. So we want to be able to have a full circle where we can go at will uh, from time domain to the frequency domain and from the frequency domain back to the time domain. So it turns out this is a little known uh, uh, historical uh, uh, curiosity. Uh, 
that Joseph Fourier had a twin brother. In fact, Josier, uh, Fourier's um, twin brother was an evil twin brother, and, and he was always trying to undo everything that Fourier ever did. So this is uh, Fourier's uh, evil twin brother. His name is uh, Envy, or his friends call him Envy. And basically what he did is give us a, a method to undo everything that Fourier did. So he allows us to go, or he provides us with the means to go from the frequency domain back to the time domain. Okay, so this is now uh, complete. This is what we need. We can get from the time domain to the frequency domain via the Fourier transform. And we can undo everything we did uh, via the inverse Fourier transform. We can get from the frequency domain back to the time domain. Very briefly, um, uh, how does the inverse Fourier transform work? It's actually not so complicated. Um, in fact, we've already uh, basically conceptually done the, the inverse Fourier transform. What we did previously was um, take a bunch of individual sine waves and sum them up to get a more complicated signal. Now, when we did this in our little toy example, we made up the sine waves. We, we arbitrarily chose which frequencies and amplitudes and phases to give them. The idea of the inverse Fourier transform is that uh, the frequencies are defined according to the time points. Um, and the um, amplitudes and phases are not arbitrarily defined, but instead they are defined by the um, Fourier coefficients the results of each step of the uh, of the Fourier transform. And this is basically how the inverse Fourier transform works. So now we can uh, switch back to MATLAB and have a look at the inverse Fourier transform. And here you can already recognize this loop looks very similar to the Fourier transform. Um, but there's no dot product here. So instead what we are doing is creating this complex sine wave and again, you should be able to see that there is a sine wave in here. It's 2 pi ft. Um, and you can also see Euler's formula in here, so e to the i something. Um, and now what we are doing is scaling each of these sine waves by the Fourier coefficients. And then we sum all of these together. And that gives us our, um, our original time series. So you can see the original time series is in uh, 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 red, and the reconstruction from the Fourier, the inverse Fourier, uh, the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of the original time series gets a bit confusing to talk about this. Uh, uh, is plotted uh, here in in uh, in blue. Okay, so and. Uh, like the, um, the fast Fourier transform instead of the discrete time Fourier transform, in practice, when you want to compute the inverse Fourier transform, um, you should not use this whole uh, loop here, but instead you should use the function uh, IF of T, which stands for, of course, inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so now this is very powerful because we can go from the time domain uh, to the frequency domain and back. And you will learn in the course of doing uh, EEG data analyses, and in particular time frequency based analyses, that this is a very powerful uh, mechanism because many analyses can be done much more efficiently and much more quickly in the frequency domain compared to in the time domain. So very often, for example, with filtering and with uh, convolution, which is one of the main ways that we use uh, or one of the main ways we perform time frequency decomposition. It's actually faster to take time domain signals, put them into the frequency domain, do the analyses in the frequency domain, and then go back to the time domain. That turns out to be much uh, faster than doing all the analyses only in the time domain. So I'm not going to um, give a full example of this right now. I'll save that for, uh, for some lectures in the future. But just to give you an idea just to give you a little bit of um, some insight into uh, where we can go with this. The way that bandpass filtering works, or one of the ways that we implement bandpass filtering, is by taking the Fourier transform of our EEG data, which might look something like this. I just found this picture on the internet somewhere. Um, we take the Fourier transform of our EEG data, 
And then in the frequency domain, we can just zero out all the frequencies that we don't want. And we leave behind all of the frequencies that we do want. So in this case, this would be a uh, alpha band uh, uh, filter. And after we, uh, we attenuate or get rid of uh, these Fourier coefficients and these Fourier coefficients, then we apply the inverse Fourier transform to go back to the time domain. And that is how we apply a bandpass filter. So turns out, you know, just, just for completeness, uh, exactly a filter like this is not really a, a very good filter because you're going to have sharp edges in the frequency domain. We will uh, discuss the reasons for these details in the future. In this slide, I just want you to have a um, conceptual idea of, of one of the ways that we use the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform for signal processing and data analysis. So I hope you found this lecture uh, informative and thank you for tolerating my uh, prisoner references.